Presentation and operation, operation presentation and the, uh, on Friday visitation that's a lot of free corner out there. So we do have a lot of dedicated patriots out here, so um, we, we appreciate it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So what's going yeah, on? Yeah, today I got the Today I got to get to know some more of the guys in the pod, and this is, you know, it's really amazing. Everybody's got such unique stories, but obviously a lot of similarities as well. And uh, it's just really, it's just, this is just a really interesting group of guys to uh, that you wouldn't expect to to meet in a jail setting. You know, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of salt, a lot of salt of the earth, hard workers. You know, people who uh, have pretty much lived good lives, and uh, we find ourselves in this very awkward situation so it's it's uh it's been really good to to have the camaraderie and just the uh in a certain way the commiseration of going through this experience but i just i firmly believe that uh the system and, and things will be better as a result of what's happened here so i think even in a jail from talking to some of these guys it sounds like conditions have improved markedly over over time and uh so you know huge kudos to the guys that were here early on and suffered through some of the the more difficult things that happened here, so pretty amazing. From, from no visitation to abusive guards and, and uh, so many things that went on in there, so yeah, it's, it's good to know conditions are abusive. Yeah, it sure seems to be. I mean, I, I <laughs> as compared compared to some of my experiences during the intake process, uh, I feel safe. <laughs> I, I didn't always feel safe in this experience. So uh, I definitely feel a lot, a lot more uh, safe now, and that, that's good. It's really good. So it's still, still a jail setting. You know, still not ideal for anybody in here. I think everybody in here would trade just about everything they have to get out of here. But uh, nonetheless, it's you know morale seems pretty high for the most part. It's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> so, what y'all did? Y'all have something good to eat? talk about what we ate or you want to say you want to say hey to your family well yeah i'd like to say hello to my family i actually called home today maybe you know, as i've been in here for two days now i've had a chance to make the phone calls that i needed to make and i uh was saving a phone call for my mother last and uh I called my father-in-law to talk about some business things that I needed to square away, and my mom and father were with him. Um, so my mother and father were with my father-in-law, and um, I heard my mom's voice, and I'm just getting emotional even thinking about it now, because, you know, even as a 40-year-old man, I still miss my mom. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to go through this. And anyway, I just, that was something today that I just, you know, <laughs> hearing my mom's voice um, she was the last phone call I wanted to make oh but yeah so my message to them is just I love them so much and uh, you know this will pass this, this will definitely pass you know this is just going to be a certain finite amount of time and someday we'll all look back on this and I hope that we're better for it that's, that's, my, that's my message yeah. You know, uh, this is Nicole Reppin, and, uh, you know, it is, it is tough. And it, I, I always want to tell people, yes, it gets so much easier, you know, and you do get uh, accustomed to making the phone calls and all of that, but it's just not right that you're in there. So there's just that on top of all of it, and just, you know, broken hearts, and you know, it, it's just the, you do get used to the phone calls, and it, do, it doesn't hit as hard, but it, it doesn't get any easier. Yeah, one of the things, you know, I've come to the realization of is, um, you know, I'm in here, you know, before I get on this phone call, and playing cards, and we watch a little TV. I mean, we have our lockdown every day, but, you know, it's a routine, and, and you can kind of get through it, no problem. But it was really being punished as the families. You know, it's the moms and the, and the children at home that are being raised without their fathers, and and uh, the mothers who are having to take jobs to pay the bills, and, and you know, we're stuck. We, you know, it's just, 
we're completely stuck. And one of the things that I hear, I've heard a couple times, um, and not just from the January 6th inmates, but also from the uh, other inmates from the D.C. area that I met in the intake process is, you know, I don't get to be the man that I'm supposed to be. You know, a man's supposed to take care of his family. He's supposed to take care of his wife. And when you're stuck in here, you don't get to do that. You know, they, they take that away from you. And I'm not saying that the criminal justice system is all bad and that some people don't need to be incarcerated, but that is something that, um, you know, I don't know that, I don't know how to factor that in. You know, I mean, how do you factor in the fact that you're punishing the most innocent people in all of this, um, in this process? And uh, that's, that's definitely something that should be taken into consideration. You know, I'm not offering any solutions, but it is something that I definitely, you know, as I talk to my wife, I'm like, you're the one that's suffering. You know, I just have to endure this. But you're the one who has to get up every day and, and take the, up the load that I used to carry. And uh, that's that's really challenging, especially with kids at home and stuff like that. So yeah, kudos absolutely. to all the people who've been here. I mean, some of these guys that I've met, you know, they've been here since January, February of 2021. You know, and they're still going through this process. I mean, it's just absolutely an extremely long amount of time to be uncertain how long this will last, uncertain how long this will go on for. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, it's just a challenge, and it's, it's a universal challenge. It's, every single person in here is going through much the same situation, you know. Every situation is different, but at the same time, it's all the same. It's all the same. Well, the situation itself is extremely unique. Um, you know, and unique, especially in, in history. And, uh, you know, that's why it's so important to make sure that, uh, you know, we can't let them dissuade us from being a community because uh, we have to have that support for each other and our families. You know, it's so important uh, to get through it that way. And so many lawyers have, have made Jan 6 families and uh, defendants not be involved in Jan 6 communities because it reflects badly, but, you know, that that's just part of what they're doing to us, too. Yeah, they really do rob you of that. Um, it's interesting, when I was going through the intake process, I made, I made, I made friends with uh, one of the uh, inmates that was on details, you know, the guy who serves your food and brings you toilet paper and stuff like that. And I, talking to him, he, he ended up in the juvenile system when he was 13 years old. You know, he made a mistake out on the streets and got his first charge. And, and then what happened was he got out on, you know, probation. And, of course, there was a, pro a probation violation. So then he ended up back in juvenile detention. And then he got out. And then he had another probation violation. And, you know, what were these probation violations? He missed an appointment. You know, he didn't call the parole officer when he got pulled over in the car. And they found out. So they, they remanded him. Then he became an adult. And, you know, it, it carried over into adulthood. And then it carried over. And, you know, it was just the, it's just this series of events where he couldn't make an appointment or he didn't check in at the right time or, you know, and, and I'm, I don't know. I'm not saying that was the only thing that ever happened in the entire time period. But he's a 30-year-old man now, and he, he's getting out of prison to, or to, or jail tomorrow. And for the first time ever, he's going to get out, and he's not going to have papers. He's not going to have parole or probation. And he's like... He actually worked it out that way. He told the judge, I don't want to get out with on probation or parole because the way that it works in his life is he just seems to run into trouble, you know, even innocent trouble, and uh, he'd get remanded and, you know, have to go back into prison. And it was just this endless cycle. And he said, you know, I haven't had, like, a criminal violation in seven years, but yet I've just been stuck coming back here 90 days at a time. You know, it seems over and over again, and, and um, it's my heart just went out to him because I'm like, yeah, you're going to get out tomorrow for the first time, and you're not going to be, you know, looking over your shoulder to see if you're going to get pulled over for running a speed, a stop sign or something like that, you know, and forget to tell your parole officer. I mean, there's just so many different scenarios that this, uh, this system can become really overwhelming, especially if you don't have support groups or good attorneys that can kind of tell you what you can and can't do. That was one thing he said. He's like, at the time, I didn't even know that I broke my parole because I didn't know what the rules were. No one explained it to me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not making it, again, i got to be careful. You can't paint with a broad brush. That was just his experience that he shared with me. But uh, I imagine that that happens a lot. Well, you know, yeah, I imagine there's a lot of people kind of stuck in that. Especially if you think about the fact that prisons are really businesses and they're in it to make money. So they have those repeat customers and they set people up for failure from the yeah. You know, that's, that's just, uh, it's no different than any other business. They need repeat customers. And we saw that they 
Yeah. Yeah, and there was, like, we went to a Superior Court case outside the federal system, and they there were lots of mistakes made. And it's some of it is the overwhelming caseload on public defenders, but they do they have they have paid for more prosecuting attorneys, and they have cut the, the um, you know the, the the defense attorneys. So you know it really is a system set up to fail. I just I just wondered is the person you're talking about that's coming out tomorrow with absolutely no papers for the first time? Does he have family support and somebody that will help him when he gets out of jail? to some people I know that can help and book them, um, to give him some mentorship outside of the oh my gosh, wow. he has children so he is going back home to a family um, but I, I did I, I actually passed on um, some people that, that can give him some direct support mentorship guidance he does he wants to get that he wants to start the business um, the reason that we even kind of encountered was you know we need to work that uh -oh, you're, you're breaking up a little. You're breaking up a little. Maybe move around a little bit. Is that any better? Yes, that is better. Is that any better? Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Okay, so he gave me a book to read while I was in there called White Guys Can't Have All the Wealth by Cedric Nash. And uh, it's, a, it's a finance, you know, millionaire mindset type book, uh, much in the Anthony Robbins genre, but it was geared towards, you know, African Americans or black men who want to succeed. And uh, as I was reading it, I was like, I didn't realize that, you know, that this is a, a challenge for you, you know, that, that, that getting good mentors and good help would be hard. So I, I, uh, I did, I passed on some, some people that can help him. And I called those people and told them that he would be contacting him because, yeah, I mean, we've got to support not just ourselves, but we've got to reach out and support everybody. Um, you know, it would be a travesty if if, uh, if we only tried to help ourselves in this, because it's like you said, the system is a business, and there's more victims than just us. That's right. No, absolutely. And, you know, we know that, that uh, a lot of the people in jail are being prepared for things to come, and I know that y'all are going to come out and be great people and make some great changes. We're counting on it. Yeah, I do believe it. Uh, based on the quality of the men that I've seen in here and that, uh, I do believe that there are going to be long-term uh, attempts to change and fix this, this system, to bring some more compassion to it, to bring some more equity. And I don't mean equity in kind of the negative sense, but the equity in the fact that there's fairness and equality in here, that uh, there's not two standards of justice that are being applied. And, you know, and that doesn't mean that we apply tough justice left and right. You know, it just means that we have compassion where compassion is needed and where, where toughness is needed, there's toughness. And um, there's a way to do that. You know, there's a way to do that. But it, it's going to take everybody having clear eyes and, and really assessing it. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, this has been the, the, the siren song of so many people who have been affected by the criminal justice system for so many years. And uh, adding our, our January 6th voices to it will hopefully continue the improvement. I do know that uh, Donald Trump's First Step Act is quite talked about uh, when I was in the intake. You know, I've only been here two days, so I spent more time in intake. They talk about it all the time. You know, they talk about uh, how that it's a better for them because, you know, instead of getting 20-year sentences, they actually can, they're incentivized and sit inside of the jail system to uh, work, do good behavior because it, it gets them out earlier. So I think that's a really good, a good thing. It is a good first step. Uh, yeah, you know, it, we have one minute remaining. Uh, it is actually, it, it, I think it's an amazing program. A lot of Jane Sixers so far have, so many have been denied it, but there's also an issue within the BOP uh, not applying the time correctly and not really having the manpower to make sure these people are able to get out of the system when they're supposed to. This, this issue needs to be raised with Mike Johnson directly. Mike Johnson has the ability to make some of those changes. Uh, this, this whole system is operating, in my opinion, under you know, a legislative directive. So Mike Johnson needs to be made aware of the fact that that is happening, that people are being denied the right classifications and things like that. And at least it needs to be looked at by Mike Johnson and the Speaker of the House and the legislature. That's the appropriate place to take those complaints. And, and stuff. Absolutely. We're about to run out of time. Uh, please call back tomorrow night. We love speaking with you. God bless you. And
God bless all that you're uh, that you did for that kid. Get mad. Thank you for using. Go ahead.